Welcome back to our next edition of the Foundations of the Christian Faith Study. And uh, today we're going to be looking at the first part of the result of the fall. I am going to be breaking these apart into a little bit smaller lessons. Um, hopefully that's a little bit better. Uh, just, you know, easier to follow along if there's not quite so much to follow along with. And so I'm guessing I'm going to shoot for these being about 20-25 minutes apiece. And so I'm going to take all my notes and kind of split them in half down the middle. Um, and uh, so today we are beginning the second study in book two, and this is the result of the fall. So last time we talked about the fall, we talked about a lot of the, the circumstances around it. And uh, this time we actually want to look at what were the final results? What, what happened in the fall that was so impactful? And we are going to start out by looking at Matthew 9.12. So in Matthew 9, 12, it says, But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. And that is a very important distinction. That uh, It was one of those things of the day is that the Pharisees were very much angry about the fact that Jesus was there at this, you know, it, at this party dining with tax collectors and with sinners. Um, and, uh, you know, he's like, you know, why are you doing this? And this is one of those things with us is that oftentimes in the modern Christian world, we get so concerned about the fact that we are, you know, associating with bad people. And the reality is we don't want to live in perfectly sanitized little bubbles. That's not the objective of the Christian life is to be in those perfect little bubbles. And so, uh, with that being said, um, Jesus confronts the Pharisees by saying it is the sick. Now, the counterbalance to that is that we don't want to go in and, and endeavor and, and just go through all these parties and participate. The Christian life is, is avoiding the two extremes. Anytime you find yourself on one of two extremes, whether too radical towards the culture or too radical against it, uh, we can have problems. And this is what Jesus was doing is he was there amongst the people who are the tax collectors and the sinners, um, the, the bad people of society, but he wasn't participating or engaging in what they did. Um, and so that's kind of what we're talking about. So we're going to be looking at the results of the fall. So we generally dislike sin and want to avoid the subject vehemently. Okay. Uh, and this is kind of this, this, uh, aspect of, of the church. We do that oftentimes like in our modern Western culture that happens more than not. We want to forget about or ignore sin because it starts sounding judgmental says, when we are criticized, we tend to defend ourselves, even in the face of absolute proof that we did wrong. So go back and look at, once again, that story and the scenario we looked at with Adam and Eve last week, uh, or the last couple studies, you know, even in the midst of God physically being inside their presence, they still tried to pass the buck to someone else. You know, Adam blamed Eve, Eve blamed the serpent, and the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. So, you know. <sighs> okay, but once we can embrace our faults, we can start realizing our need for a Savior and look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith. This is that core thing. Even in the soft theology of a decade ago, we would have this simple ABCs, admit you're a sinner, uh, believe unto Christ, and confess, right? Uh, and and even today in our modern day, in 2017, 2018, I've started to see a decline of even calling sin, sin. No one even wants to acknowledge the sin. But the fact is, it is that very first thing. If you do not see the sin in your life, you do not see the need for the Savior. And until you come to your sin and acknowledge it, you are going to be at danger of staying inside of it. But once we look to our sin and we see and acknowledge our sin, then we realize our need for a Savior. Once we realize our need for a Savior, then we can look to Jesus who accomplished that for us. And so uh, we're going to look at the degree and the extent of sin. 
Um, so, and we're going to kind of start out with a little bit of philosophy stuff. We'll get into the, some some scripture a little bit later here. Um, but as far as uh, as far as uh, this degree and the extent, there are two faulty arguments. Uh, one is that we are not as bad as the Bible says. In other words, mankind is good. And this is that, that debate. Is man basically good and only does evil in results of bad circumstances, or is man really evil? Um, so the, the, uh, the next point is um, basically mankind is sick, or is it mankind is dead? So we're just going to examine all this. Okay, so people believe that since the Bible times were so dark, our teachings come from a savage world, and thus we are presented in the worst way they are. Now, the reality is that what a lot of people say is the scripture is so full uh, of real humanity. It's not fake. It's not artificial. It's not, you know, that kind of stuff. It, what it is really is it is it is an understanding. It, it grabs the human condition perfectly. It is not written in this stark and savage time. The significance of it is that it is written with the depth of true humanity. Okay, so we just need some casual checkups, some exercise, some vitamins in the spiritual sense. And in our modern world, we need to seek the spirituality and enlightenment. Some of these are uh, like the, the spirituality is reached by yoga, meditation, and gurus. And enlightenment is reached by psychedelic drugs. All right. So um, remember we're on that, that topic and that subject is we are not as bad as the Bible says we are. Okay. So basically in in our modern day it's like we're good and this is that whole concept we've been talking about the philosophies like modernism uh pre-modernism modernism and postmodernism remember that modernism was that we can reach the end goal of saving mankind we can solve poverty we can solve hunger we can solve diseases and then we got to this point where we realized we really can't we're kind of powerless over it all and so in the sense of this, we all seek a form of God. And this is something Paul alludes to very well in the first chapter of Romans, that, that we all seek a sense of God. And in the modern vernacular, what that seems to mean is that that says that, that we want to seek some form of spirituality or some enlightenment. This is the biggest problem with the 70s, the 60s and the 70s uh, in here in the United States, where we have this big proliferation of free love and a drug culture and, and uh, Timothy Leary, tune in, turn on and drop out. Or was it turn on, tune in and drop out? Turn on, tune in and drop out course by utilizing psychedelic drugs and so there's an entire view of spirituality that looks for some form of spirituality and some form of enlightenment and the reason we do this is that we're not truly bad is the bible um and so um, to the contrary if we are not really that bad as time progresses we will get better as hu as humans as people and this is what the philosophy was when we got into that first part of that modernism d ages. Uh, we started to realize that with enough scientific discovery, we can solve the world's problems. But what we found is faster ways to reach our deteriorating ends. And that's why when I was young, and I, I talk about this uh, you know, with, with younger people, when I was young, pornographer, for example, it was hard to find. Nowadays, Pretty much, like you can get pornography. I remember counseling a, a really young kid uh, almost a decade ago. He was telling me about, about some addictions he had in those areas. He was using his Nintendo DS at the time to look at porn. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. And it's just like, when I was a kid, man, you might find a picture every now and again. It was hard to find. Video was pretty much non-existent. I mean, it was hard to find that kind of stuff. But that's what Ravi Zacharias says. We, as our technology increases, we have increased means to reach our deteriorating ends. Okay. And so 
if we really are just going to get better with, you know, we would get better if time progresses if we were just sick and just we needed more knowledge, we needed more education, we needed more. This is why education can't solve the problem. It helps, but it can't solve the problem. Okay, we generally gravitate towards the worst. This is why our societies right now are so divided, so hurt, so torn. An honest examination of the progress of mankind <laughs> will demonstrate that we are not better. Okay, so let's go back to, I said there are two faulty arguments. One of those is that man is sick. And one of those is that man is not as bad as as we say. Okay. So under the topic, um, and the reason I stumbled at the beginning is is I had three points under that two points, and the last point is is the counterbalance. <laughs> so that's why I apologize for that. Okay, mankind is sick. This view suggests that we have problems. And it may be mortal, but we can overcome it with medicine. Now, this is the argument that stems itself from Arminianism, that we're not fully gone. We're not fully dead. We are just in a desperate state. And in that desperate state, we just need to reach out for something. So we seek a spiritual teaching or of enlightened masters who will tell us to deny reality or to put away our desires. You know, Christian science denies medicine. It tells us there is no nothing wrong. There's because the material world itself is fallacy. That's bound up in the heart of Christian science. It's like grape nuts. It's not grapes. It's not nuts. It's not Christian. It's not science. Um, but regardless, uh, we have to have that, that balance. Okay. Even if our condition is presently incurable, it will eventually become so through the progress of man. <laughs> Again, modernism comes back. We need to cast off the moral straight jacket of mankind is what they would say. Uh, cast off the idea that morality is from something else and, and causing our, ourselves. Um, and then uh, like like these points, um, through progress, we will cure our condition. However, history shows that we devolve, not evolve. So we are truly, like some people will say that, that we're not as bad as mankind. Other people will say we are sick. Those are the two, uh, the two errors. So what is the truth according to Scripture? Well, according to Scripture, uh, looking at Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That is not sick. That is not, we're doing, we're good people. We're just in bad circumstances. No, we are dead. Okay. A dead man cannot take medicine. A dead man cannot be healed. A dead man must be resurrected and it's outside the ability of the man himself. And that is the first principle. Um, so in Romans, 5, uh, 12 to 14 says, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all have sinned for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even though over those who had not sinned and the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. Okay. So we were dead we did not even have an inkling of it until the law was presented. Okay. In fact, in the American vernacular, we have an expression that says ignorance of the law is no excuse. Okay. It doesn't matter if you are aware of the law or not. If you're in violation of it, you're in violation of it. Okay. Uh, this is particularly saying if you're traveling through the countries, for example, you know, I'm, I'm in a, you know, I'm in a, a gun friendly state and, you know, Ohio is a gun friendly state, Indiana, I forget, but if you cross into Illinois with a gun and you get caught with that, that's bad news. Okay. Whether you are aware of the crazy gun laws in Illinois or not, ignorance of the law does not excuse you. Okay. So we were dead regardless we were only made knowledgeable about our death 
when the law was given to us. And that is what it says in, in verse 13 there, until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed where there was no law. All right. Um, so there is a modern view that our guilty conscience is fabricated by a restricting religion. We start to see this a lot as as various uh, various morality groups spread up, and and of course this was this was what was pointed out if you read a lot of the um, pro homosexual Christian literature. Um, they'll come out and say that that this this anti gay stuff is just a, a moral construct of a, an over religious society. Uh, that's the thing they would say. And the scary part to me is that well they got their way and it's now perfectly legal and I don't have a problem with that because this entire scripture was written in a culture where that was legal. It doesn't bother me at all. Uh, I'm not going to participate on the basis of my faith, but nevertheless, that doesn't bother me if, if America moves in that direction. But what does start to bother me is that the very same statements are being starting to be applied to guys like pedophiles. Well, that what's to say if it's the one, if it's not the other, if it's all just a moral construct, you know, if, if, if morality itself is exclusively imposed by society, if there is nothing outside, who's to say that every law isn't perfectly moral in and of itself. And that's one of C.S. Lewis's great arguments that he could not overcome and why he became a Christian is because he could not get beyond the fact that there was a morality out there. He just couldn't explain it. Um, and again, as Zacharias uh, mentions, you know, some people would, would have challenged him on this statement. He says, well, if I brought a little baby up here and hacked it into pieces, would you say that it's wrong? And even the, the people who hold so dear to this principle will still say, I don't like it, but I can't say it's wrong. That's what we're talking about. Morality is not a construct of a restricting religion. It is something that God placed on our heart as a conscience. Which is why when we start to see somebody who has no problems with death, we start diagnosing them as a sociopath because they are disjointed from the morality of life itself. And we have to keep that in mind. Uh, Jeremiah 17.9 Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? That is our present condition. That is our present thoughts. The heart itself is desperate. It is wicked. It is horrible. We justify some of the most horrible things in some of the grossest ways because our hearts are sick and our condition is desperate. All right, so we're going to look at the death of the spirit, the body, and the soul. So we are actually going to do just a brief introduction on this part, and then we're going to wrap this up with the spirit, and then next time we're going to pick up with the soul and the body. Okay, so like God is created as a trinity, so is man. We are created with a body, a soul, and a spirit. And the fall touched each one of us. This is that central principle in, uh, in the Calvinist view, the total depravity. Some people say, well, total depravity doesn't make sense because people can still do good things even if they're not saved. Well, total depravity doesn't mean you're completely wicked. Total depravity means all aspects of humanity are touched by the fall. It doesn't mean they're completely wicked. So each one of those, we have a body is touched by the fall. We have a spirit touched by the fall and we have a soul that is touched by the fall okay so the fall affected each one of these the spirit died when adam ate the fruit and that death was imputed to all of his children remember that word imputed it's a legal term it means that that 
the unrighteousness and the consequence of Adam's sin becomes our sin. The concept of original sin. And this was the significance of Christ being born of a virgin. He had to be born of a virgin or he would not have uh, he would not have that power to save because he does not contain Adam's original sin. He is in se- instead the seed of God, sinless and perfect. So, yeah, I mean, Rob Bell asked that question in Velvet Elvis. If, if evidence came out that Jesus had a biological father named Larry, would that impact your faith? Rob Bell's a moron for even asking the question because if Jesus has a biological father, he contains original sin and he is in our same condition and powerless to save us. It is important that he is not of the seed of Adam. So when, uh, when we, uh, when Adam ate that fruit, that death was imputed to all of us. Jesus was born of God. No biological father named Larry, not of man. The soul experienced a disconnect from God. It was like a plant pulled out of the ground. It started to die. Look at those analogies in John 15. The vine. He talks about, you know, the the vine gets its sustenance from the root. And the soul at the fall, our soul was pulled out. It was that vine was pulled out of that root. And now air is gasping it and suffocating it and destroying it and deteriorating it from inside out. That is what happens in our soul. And the body now ages and returns to dust. So we're going to continue, uh, consider each of these. We're going to look at the spirit first. So the spirit, the spiritual death of man was instantaneous. As soon as Adam and Eve ate the fruit, and it seems that though they ate at the same time, remember in Genesis 3, Eve took fruit off the tree and gave it to her husband who was there, and they ate of it. At the same time, when they ate of it, the spiritual death was instantaneous. Immediately, they hid from God. They hid their bodies, but they hid their minds and their hearts and their spirits. They experienced alienation, a sense of unbelonging. Remember that prior to this, they experienced regular walks and regular talks with God in the garden. But after this, they had this sense of unbelonging. And all of us have this sense of unbelonging at times. We feel it in our hearts that, that there's something else. We, we want it, especially those of us uh, those of us who are saved and, and, and will be saved, we have this sense about us, this feeling that we're not all of this world. That is that, that feeling. They had that sense of alienation. Uh, let's have a look at Romans uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 10 uh, through 18. This is a, a fabulous passage, which is strung together by a series of Proverbs, or, um, uh, Psalms, and, and some verses from Isaiah. Um, it says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongue they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is on their lips, and those whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known, and there is no fear of God before their eyes. Okay, our spiritual death removed us from the presence of God and prevents us from having a relationship with him. It's that chasm as is often written about. You know, you have this great chasm and they draw a cross in the middle. So the cross allows you to cross over on a bridge over to God. That's a true point as far as the chasm is concerned. Because the chasm will tell us uh, that, that we cannot come close to God on our own. A bridge must be built and that bridge was Christ. Okay, the death of the spirit affects us in three very specific ways. The first is the moral nature. Okay, so we run from the righteousness of God and instead gravitate to things against his nature. Okay, so 
in our morality, in the sense of what we do, we tend to run away from God. Uh, one of the favorite analogies from John 3, he talks about the light is in the world, but men run from the light because they love the darkness. And the greatest analogy is I used to come home, you know, my uh, I stayed with my at my brother's house in, in college when I worked in the restaurants over the weekends because I would get all my, you know, all my full-time schedule done all over the weekend, crowded into like, you know, 12-hour shifts over the weekend. And we'd come back in from closing the restaurant. He was kind of in a bad part of the city up there. We'd come in and, and turn on the lights and you'd see the cockroaches scatter. And that's kind of the, that's what it's like. We gravitate towards the darkness we gravitate towards those types of things we run from the righteousness of God and instead gravitate towards things that we glorify in our own sinful nature the second is um, the intellectual nature is affected we start thinking in degrading ways rather than focusing on God and his thoughts how hard is it to keep your mind focused and praying on God how easy is it to go towards worry go towards the world or go towards sin so in our morality we move towards uh, away from God uh, towards things that are evil in our mind we start to gravitate towards those things and the last is the nature of our will. We seek sin instead of God. And one preacher said that our free will is limited to us choosing our particular sin. And be sure that the devil keeps probing us. Which sin do we fall on? Some of us will fall towards sex. Some of us will fall towards drugs. Some of us will fall towards pride. And what affects you may not affect someone else. Uh, but, and I agree with this point, we do... Uh, we do have uh, proclivities towards certain sins. And that preacher was right. Our free will is limited to how we choose our sin. Because everyone talks about free will and free will. You know, we are free uh, in many ways. And one of those is that, yeah, we're free to pick the sin that we pick. And that is... Um, that is that. All right, so uh, that's where we're going to conclude for today. Uh, next time we're going to pick up on how does the fall impact the soul and the body. Uh, so thanks for watching uh, this part here. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can check out ourwalkinchrist.com forward slash support. I do have some books if you are a reader. Um, I have Testing and Temptations. is a book about sanctification, how to grow in Christ. And uh, that is available both paperback and a digital copy. You can get those directly at ourwalkinchrist.com if you're in the United States. You can get them on Amazon around the world. I also have The Art of Shallow Neighboring, which is a parallel book about first world Christianity and uh, some other areas uh, about that and uh, again you can get that uh, at ourwalkinchrist.com uh, if you're in the United States uh, and you can get that on on Amazon and other places online um, both print and uh, digital copies are available uh, all over the place so thanks for that uh, for watching and um, enjoy your uh, daily walk in our Lord